Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today at another great panel discussion at the National Incubation Center. I'm Basim Mehta, I'm the program manager at the NIC. So thank you all who have joined us uh, via this Zoom webinar in attendance or also on our Facebook page. Today, I have uh, an old friend with me as a guest that I have uh, the privilege to talk to today in light of the recent changes that happened uh, in the Companies Act by the Security and Exchange Commission of Pakistan. And uh, this friend, uh, as you may all know, because you joined the talk, is Barrister Ahmed Uzair. And uh, knows no introduction, those people who work in the startup space, by the way, because he has been, mashallah, uh, working with startups and has been uh, quite an advocate of the technology law. Uh, he also advises various incubators, accelerators, PCs, and many startups as well. Uh, so Barrister Rosair actually completed his LLB in, uh, from Cardiff uh, in the UK and then was called to the bar by Lincoln's Inn at the age of 23. Uh, Barrister Rosair also routinely writes and uh, has published papers with Pakistan Law Digest and the Council Magazine, Karachi, and also the Human Rights Journal. He's the co-author of a book titled uh, Alternative Dispute Resolution Review, published by the Law Business Research in London. And he's also the co-author of Pakistan's first corporate law magazine called The Council. He's the founding member of uh, Continuing Legal Education Initiative of Pakistan, which aims to raise the overall standard of the bar. Welcome, sir. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Fazi. So, uh, Zaid, this will be a mixed English and Urdu conversation. We do have an uh, audience uh, who has uh, uh, their background as founders, probably startups or working within teams of different startups and would be asking lots of questions. And guys who want to ask questions or join us on Zoom, you have the Q&A section. Please do ask and we will take the questions uh, at the end, we will answer them. And those who are joining us on Facebook Live, uh, post it in the comment section. NIC team is already looking at the comments. They will be pasting it here uh, in the form of a question and we'll uh, take it live, inshallah. So Zed, tell us about yourself. Uh, other than the very brief intro that I gave, who is Uzair and how did you end up with technology and startups? Uh, so, so this is uh, uh, an interesting question. I've, I've been involved in some way or the other with the technology sector from 2004. This was uh, around the period when I was finishing uh, my A-levels and I used to work at a call center at night. And um, you, you, can, you can imagine the, the energy that's there and the, the, the young guys and girls who are working um, in those call centers are generally uh, the techie type. And I always found myself very comfortable around that. And so it's, it's been something that I have uh, very much enjoyed. I actually wanted to be a computer engineer, but uh, as luck would uh, hold, I ended up becoming a lawyer, but I'm very lucky because now I'm able to work with this, the same engineer friends that I had at that time. So for the last 14, 15 years, some of those are, are entrepreneurs in themselves and I'm very happy to work with them. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's been a coincidence. I don't have anybody uh, in the legal profession in, in terms of my family. So this was just a coincidence that I happened to become a lawyer and a barrister. Right. Sometimes coincidence happen for a very right reason. So, uh, Uzair, before we jump into the Companies Act amendments that were promulgated uh, 30th April and turned into a law, and yeah. I believe this was after a series of consultations in which we also met earlier. Uh, SECP yeah. did many road shows. I know Shaza, Abdul Rahim, and their team did a great job. Uh, and and uh, there are many questions on on sandbox and force major how that's going to be playing in COVID. But before we get to all that, the, the juicy part, let's go to some very basics. So yeah. the State Bank of Pakistan in its prudential regulations defines what is a small and a medium enterprise for a large company, depending on the basis of the employees and also on the sales or the turnover. Similarly, there are some, somewhat a uh, little different, but uh, similar definitions by the FBR, but SECP also had the same. Uh, nowhere there is a definition where startup can be classified. Has that been fixed? And if so, what is the definition of a startup now? 
that's a that's a very good question so um, it it was one of those uh, questions that that probably attracted one of the most heated conversations when we were doing the road show with the SCCP and um, we looked at what a lot of other countries have done um, you have correctly uh, uh, pointed out that state bank has a definition of a uh, small and medium company but they don't use the word startup per se what the fbr has done in the income tax ordinance is to define startup as as very uh, narrow tech focused um, uh, technology company essentially which um, working with a lot of startups i felt was a little too narrow and did not reflect the wider tech, uh, entrepreneur uh, and ecosystem that we have startup ecosystem that we had and so we we wanted to give it as broad an explanation or or um, uh, definition as possible without making it um, you know unreasonable so essentially we uh, have three criteria uh, number one uh, you can be a startup if you are younger than 10 years in terms of um, uh, when you were incorporated as a company that's number one number two uh, if you have at any point in time in the last 10 years um had a revenue or sorry a turnover of more than uh, 500 million then you go outside of that definition and thirdly perhaps more interestingly it is if you are uh, an innovative company you are bringing a, about a change in the industry that you're operating in and uh, it is a rapidly scalable business if that is the case then you will be classified as a as a startup now if you try to um, be a little nitpicky i would say that this is also susceptible to uh, multiple interpretations but looking at the language i feel that it is broadly as wide encapsulating as possible in terms of what what you can classify any startup that that you deal with or or has otherwise uh, looking to to raise capital for example so oh, thank you so you said that there was lot of back and forth and there was a heated discussion uh, on the definition of startup what were those reservations and how much uh, to what extent uh, those reservations have been uh, addressed in this definition and secondly is this definition harmonious across ccp fbr and state bank so uh, it it has definitely been reflected uh, i think the the definition that that we had originally internally drafted uh, i mean the sccp had internally drafted uh, was perhaps a little restrictive the number of of years for example we had originally proposed were 5 uh, in terms of age of the company now it is 10 so this this came up in in conversations and so uh, definitely feedback was incorporated and and the language that we finally have in the in the companies act now is reflective of that feedback uh, now whether we have a harmonious definition or not the short answer is is no because uh, obviously fbr is hasn't had the chance to uh, look at its definition which obviously was introduced a couple of years back uh, to give special tax benefits and 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 this is uh, something that is probably going to be rectified in the in the near future so currently the the tax law is a little narrow in terms of the benefits that are given to startups whereas what the company law now proposes as a definition is probably um, uh, much more broader thank you so while many other areas were addressed uh, in this uh, amendment actually ek one more thing first i got there many people are calling it the startup act or law i believe uh, it is it deserves a clarification from a barrister as well i've been talking about it it's the same companies ordinance 1984 which has been amended time and again and now it's a 2020 companies act can you please touch upon that as well my pleasure my pleasure so i don't need to go go into the history of how companies ordinance 1984 no, no. came about but we had companies ordinance 1984 we've all grown up uh, utilizing that in 2017 uh, a new law was passed it is it, it is now called companies act 2017 
by and large it is a, a new law it recognizes technology it recognizes the incorporation of technology in the way the companies are formed a lot of documentations are filed a lot of meetings are conducted a lot of you know uh, board meetings are conducted digitally so the law has been substantially modified and it i would classify it as a 21st century law and it obviously isn't perfect and what the 2002 ordinance is has done is it has amended some sections of the uh, companies act 2017 so we can forget about the companies ordinance 1984 that that has been repealed except some some minor sections but other than that we have the new law which is companies act 2017 and this ordinance essentially makes changes to some sections Fair enough, but there is no separate startup act that has been passed. That's what I wanted to clarify. No. Yeah. So uh, yeah, a lot of uh, friends who have joined here and those who probably are watching us on Facebook, uh, many of them ask me about startup laws. So just wanted to clarify that the law is not called a startup law; it comes under the Companies Act. Uh, yes. Let's start from a, a, a very big pain point uh, that we've seen in the industry for a while, and. Uh, One of the great advantages in West or other countries where startups have really flourished is because of employee stock option plans yeah. uh, or e yeah. ESOPs uh, yeah. for short. So stock options have been really, really lucrative. When you reach the scale of going for an exit or a buyout or an IPO, they come in handy, yeah. and you don't have to burn a, uh, a lot of cash at the initial days. You you stay lean, but also you keep your staff very motivated. Uh, yeah. what has been done regarding stock options how can our startups access it what is the process so can you please shed some light on that certainly so um, when when we went to the sccp and we identified the issues that we had with the company's law uh, employee stock options was certainly one of the uh, issues that that were highlighted they were very kind enough and receptive and they understood what esaps was so uh, interesting and let me link it to the last answer i gave you now the company's ordinance 1984 did not talk about employee stock options whereas the company's act 2017 did and hence everybody knew what it was the only problem was that uh, the law had limited it to public limited companies now um, employee stock options are very common in the west and they uh, do come in the form of stocks uh, stock options given to employees by listed companies so and it is now common for even private companies to issue them and so the 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 trickle down from what we had to what we now uh, have achieved is is wasn't a lot essentially the 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 block that existed that said that this this mechanism is only available to public companies has been removed and now even private companies can avail it now what it means in terms of the mechanics um i don't have a ready answer for you because um, as i pointed out uh, the mechanics will be introduced in the form of regulations and currently the SC, uh, the accp hasn't promulgated the, the regulations we're probably going to uh, to develop those those uh, regulations so that people can can start issuing employee stock options but if we have to go anyway by uh, the manner in which it is done in the in for, for public companies you uh, pass a board resolution that 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 uh, a certain percentage of the uh, outstanding share capital is going to be issued in the form of employee stock options um, and you submit it to the sccp uh, and, and it's just a regular filing that you do uh, like a lot of filing so um, provided the the mechanics are are similar we will have um, the sccp is going to give you the green signal and you will be able to issue those employee stock options to your employees now um, as you can we, we can just briefly discuss what is the benefit of of esops now for a for a startup company if you want to uh, attract quality human resource sometimes and in fact most of the times you do not have the capacity to pay them the market share, market salaries right and so you tell them that this is a high growth startup work with us for 3 years or 2 years and and once we we either get some sort sort of a funding or an exit or an ipo you you're going to uh, reap a lot of benefit in investing uh, yourself with us and uh, you reward them in the form of uh, employee stock options 
and so those options essentially are are a hook for the for the employees to to participate and and work towards the growth of the company and so it gives the employee a certain sense of ownership as well brilliant we we getting lots of questions we'll take them at the end it started so keep keep them coming guys it's very nice and i'm going through the questions that you're putting out there so you you mentioned uh, about the stock options being there uh, has there been any issue in terms of the stock options being utilized by startups vis-a-vis -vis companies uh, who who are uh, fairly well structured or fairly well funded uh, so what do you what do you think has been a challenge in asking more and more startups especially uh, lots of us uh, who, who run these incubators and and the community uh, of all the national incubation centers for instance uh, they would like yeah. to know as well yeah so, how can uh, the small stage startups can get more benefit out of it because mostly uh, and it might be a perception that it is for a uh, more structured companies with large fundings and all that and the process or the documentation is fairly large so uh, do you think it is easier for small startups as well to apply certainly so uh, it is just like uh, uh, setting up a company right so once you are setting up the company you you tell the regulator wh how or what are the number of shareholders so for example if you say that uh, you and i are setting up a startup we register that that company now uh, let's say that that company has 100 shares and you decide that you and i both have 50 shares each now we decide to uh, employ the services of uh, let's say abed and we want abed to form uh, to be part of the company and we say that you will give you uh, 10 shares provided that you work with us for 2 years now what are we doing we are giving that employee a stock option we have we are telling that employee that that in 2 years time you will have 10 shares which which currently are valued x but will probably be valued much more in 2 years time and and this was still happening before this this change was introduced uh, this was but it was unofficial uh, what was typically happening is either yourself or i would be issued those shares in the company and we would then after two years transfer them to abit but now what we will be able to do is tell exactly what it is this is beneficial for not just you and i for clarity's sake that what share is yours is yours what is mine is mine and what abit's will be in two years time will be in two years time but what it also helps is a potential investor understanding exactly what the structure of the company is and so it, it there is there is certainly no complexity and i've given you a very simple example for between three people setting up a employee stock option thank you so much so uh, this takes me to the next part as well so and often we've seen in cash strapped startups owners and employees they typically accept salaries which are below their market values right yeah. and in return of for a stake in the company often called as sweat equity so yeah. how is sweat equity now addressed was it not part of it earlier and uh, is the process of calculating it and realizing it addressed in the new law can you please also uh, share more details about the sweat equity area certainly so um there is certainly a, 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 some overlap between uh, what sweat equity we are talking about uh, sweat equity and employee stock options essentially um, it can be in a uh, in, in a similar scenario but the way i look at it is that sweat equity is is generally for consultants so you for example we we both start and start thinking about uh, uh, let's say an artificial intelligence based uh, technology solution now you and i both are not uh, uh, scientists and we, we are not ex we, we are not professors of artificial intelligence we say that we employ the services of a, a university professor and we want to give him or her uh, some some uh, stake in the business um, for the effort that they are going to put in they are not employees they cannot be employees so they they are not strictly falling under the employee stock option plan but what they are is professionals specialists who you want uh, to be part of your company you don't have again you don't have the money to pay the the professor but you want to offer them an opportunity to be be a shareholder in the business and that uh, shares that they are being issued is in the form of sweat equity now uh, 
in the strict of, strictest of senses, uh, threat equity was allowed. However, there was there was a fundamental issue, and that issue was that you were required to have the value of the contribution valued by uh, someone someone appointed by the SECP. So, for example, if you and I are coming together, let's take this example forward. And Cheriar is the expert that we want to employ, and we feel you and I that his contribution is worth, let's say, one million rupees. Now that one million rupees translates to, let's say, hundred shares in the company, right? Now we want to give this Cheriar hundred shares. You and I both agree we are the owners of the business, right? And so we want to give Cheriar the the hundred shares, and and he is comfortable taking that those hundred shares for the services that he is giving us. However. the accp originally uh, required somebody uh, a third person to come in and value sharia's contribution and confirm that sharia's contribution is indeed worth 1 million rupees uh, which was obviously difficult for startups right so it is difficult to quantify somebody's service there are tax implications associated with it and so it it, it was essentially impossible uh, to undertake now what the law has done is essentially made it easier for you as a startup to issue sweat sweat equity and provided uh, now again for this the accp is likely going to uh, amend the issue of share capital regulations 2018 in light of what has been changed in the law and once that is done i i believe that you will not be required to go to a evaluator essentially a third person to to tell us you and and me whether we should give those 100 shares to sharia or not because as, uh, this is how i explained it to everybody right so if you and i are 100% owners of the business and you and i both agree that sharia should be given a certain percentage of the business we don't need a third person to tell us whether what we are doing is right or wrong so this uh, this is a i believe a great relief that you do not need third persons or you know uh, by any regulatory or any other uh, regulatory watchdog to come in and tell you and this is been a pain and, but th- there is also something else which is very much related to uh, sweat equity and uh, issuing of shares to the employees which is share buyback right when you have to buy them back for whatever reason that it may be uh so or, or also called as share repurchase can you also shed some light as how it affects startups what stages they can be eligible to go for buyback what is the requirement they have to fulfill and how does the law in which section of the law perhaps if you can if you'd like to share uh, governs this part and how what is the new thing that has been done to cover the uh, share buyback certainly so uh let me first tell you like uh, esops this was actually quite an easy sell uh, because uh, the law as it existed originally um, companies they do buy their shares back and this is essentially a tool that a lot of uh, Start, uh, a lot of large scale companies use to prop up the value of their shares think of it this way if you have uh, 100 shares and each share is worth uh, 1 rupee and you the company buys back the 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 50 shares the, the 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 price of the share essentially doubles why because the number of shares are now 50 instead of 100 but the value of the business is still the same so um, this was this was a common tool for public companies but was not available for for private companies and um, the reason or situation where this is uh, useful for startups is essentially and and uh, i've given this often i've often given this as an example that um, a, a lot of startups fail uh, because of co-founder dispute and one of the reasons of co-founder dispute is Uh, a founder wants an exit and wants to leave but there is no option to exit right so uh, what this tool now allows um, the company to buy the shares from the exiting uh, co-founder 
so I, the terms and conditions of that exit can be negotiated by the company typically founders don't have the funds to to pay uh, other co-founders right but the company might especially if it is if it has certain amount of revenue that is coming in but it is not in a position to pay any dividends but what it can do is is utilize those funds to to buy back stock and that has now been allowed so for me it was uh, for me, it works for especially those startups where, let's say, there are there there is a there is a third startup. Uh, sorry, there are three founders, and one of the three founders wants to exit and wants to leave the company, but you he doesn't want to transfer it to transfer his his or her shares immediately to to the other founders without there being a formal arrangement for buyback. This law uh, now certainly allows that. And this is uh, covered, and I believe under Section 88. Now you're putting me on the stop uh, spot. <laughs> I don't remember the sections, but uh, I, I think uh, in some Q and A, I'll. I'll I just wanted to check. Are you? I just wanted to check. Are you loaded on your caffeine after if thought or not? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, just uh, uh, we can always share that with our uh, audience uh, later on, and they can also go online and search it as well on CCP's website. Uh, yeah. So, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, I have another question. So yeah. with all this that is happening, whether it is the stock options for the employees, ESOPs or the sweat equity or the share buyback, yeah. how does this open door for international investors? What, what all these amendments, and, and we are going to talk about a few more as well, how does this help startups in getting investments and how does it secure the interest for investors? So before whether I... international or otherwise VCs. Yeah, yeah. So before I answer this, I, I do want to point out and I do want to give a, a shout out to, to the SCCP, right? So as a regulator, it has taken a, a, a very proactive approach towards understanding what are the problems of the startups and trying to find within the confines of the law, whatever solutions are available. When the law became a problem, they themselves went to the government and said that we want to change the Companies Act so that it benefits startups. So we we should give uh, the SECP uh, the credit that it deserves. What, what these changes essentially mean uh, for me is that they bring them in line with what is standard around the world. Now, this is standard uh, anywhere that you look at as far as startups is concerned. Employee stock options is, is, is such, a, such a common practice for uh, early stage startups that it is. Um, uh, it was quite harmful that this is this was not available, and and hopefully uh, a lot of startups will be able to utilize this uh, and reward their key employees, and so that you know they can they can grow rapidly. Same goes with the sweat equity. It was such a pain to to structure a transaction where you had a consultant and you want to compensate the consultant, the university professor, and 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 the 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 solution used to be that you used to route uh, funds into the company indirectly and then pay that consultant back and and the law required a, a bank statement confirming that that consultant that consultant had actually paid the the funds and so it was a nightmare and it did not reflect the reality and the reality is that uh, you know the, the the company wants to issue shares to a certain person for their sweat and they should, should it shouldn't be too complicated and thankfully, now it, it is definitely less complicated than, than uh, what it was. I don't think that, and I think we both can agree on this, that, that we, we, don't, we are not in a perfect world. And as far as the regulations go, they are, they are not in their perfect place. Uh, there, are, there are two other very important stakeholders in this. One is the FDR and the other is, is State Bank. I do feel that both of the other two regulators have to... Uh, step up and they have to do a lot more than what uh, we have right now and perhaps with all of that coming together we will have uh, the truly uh, rapidly growing um, startup ecosystem that that you know uh, that we see right now certainly since you pointed out uh, the great role that SECP played, I would also like to give a shout out to the commissioner and his team, Shaza, Abdurrahim, everyone. You were one of the authors in, and, and, and I've seen you in the road shows as well. I believe it was very nice that SECP this time went out uh, to consult with corporates, with 
every stakeholder with uh, development organizations, with government organizations, with startups, with investors, uh, with NBFCs, with VCs. And there was a lot of consultation back and forth. And I'm glad, as you mentioned in the start of the conversation, that just the definition of the startup was amended because of the feedback that was taken from the roadshows. Yeah, so this, this shows a good progress. And I hope that other organizations, other regulatory bodies in the country also follow suit. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, glad, uh, it's good that, uh, that at least those who want to invest or who want to work with Pakistan's uh, companies or startups, uh, they know that some of these regulations are now in par with international standards. Uh, speaking of which, we also heard about uh, SECP launching recently a sandbox. So right. first, if you'd like to just explain to the audience who's not aware of what is the sandbox, what does this allow them, and what was the rationale behind this that have, uh, and what objectives have been achieved so far? Because I recently saw that they're inducting, I believe, for the next cohort, or yes. uh, there was some message floating around from our friends from SECP recently. So yeah, if you, if you could please uh, yeah. share some details with us on the sandbox. Certainly. So uh, Sandbox is, is an interesting um, uh, strategy, right? So I'll, I'll briefly tell you what it is. Um, Sandbox is an idea where if you have an innovative solution to a problem, a real world problem, however, you are faced with certain regulatory challenges that you feel that you will not be able to pass, uh, you can join a Sandbox where the regulator sits with you as your partner, explains the, 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 the regulations, understands uh, the problems that you're facing and helps you navigate them for a certain period of time. Now, uh, you've, you've heard about the, the applications for second co cohort. The, I believe the, the results for the, the first cohort are going to be announced, maybe um, they're expected in the coming week. Uh, so that's quite interesting. And, and I'll give you a couple of examples, which um, uh, are probably are likely to, to, to take benefit from the, from the regulatory sandbox. So consider the example of um, an equity crowdfunding. So uh, equity crowdfunding um, in the strictest of, of senses isn't permitted under law. However, it is a very powerful uh, tool to attract capital from uh, from the market, and without you, you, you're not doing any stock market listing, but at the same time, you as a founder and as a startup, if you have a crazy good idea, you can attract a lot of investment, and and billions of dollars are, are being poured into innovative solutions around the world against um, uh, in in return for equity in the form of uh, equity crowdfunding, and so. Um, most likely what will what will what is going to happen is that if uh, uh, as the startups that are operating in the equity crowdfunding space will be able to work under the regulatory sandbox which essentially provides a protection for the uh, startup they can spend 6 months to a year in the in, in, and during this time they can develop their solution look at exactly the regulations that are problematic and it also gives the regulator in this case the SCCP a very good window into understanding exactly what the solution is and how this particular startup is, is solving that uh, problem and based on that it can design and further improve its regulatory regime and so it is sort of like a, a marriage uh, between the regulatory and the regulator coming together, identifying an area where there are, there are regulatory hurdles, solving them and making it easier for others to do business in the same, uh, in, in the same domain. I believe uh, there, there has been a focus on many regulatory reforms within the FinTech industry or the non-banking financial companies. And uh, I, uh, I do see more focus there, which is good. And, and we need to do a lot of uh, work in that area. I also encourage all the startups and innovators and entrepreneurs who joined us or watching us to, to, to join SECP Sandbox. If you want to contribute, if you know of a problem that you or a hurdle uh, that you're facing and uh, let's find more innovative ways. This is a great opportunity guys, because 
uh, when organizations like SECP are so open and welcoming, let's make the most of it. Uh, so, Uzair, uh, as we're all going through this uh, very unprecedented times or the new normal that everyone is calling it, COVID has also uh, impacted many existing contracts. Yeah. Most of our startups, uh, so we did a survey of uh, around 40 startups earlier uh, at the NIC, and uh, we realized that around 24% had to shut their business down or halt their operations because of COVID. Or, or, or the result of the COVID, the lockdown earlier. Now that is easing up. Uh, some of them actually pivoted. Uh, most of them went on to these grocery deliveries and, and similar other businesses. While some who had raised a round, uh, uh, they were almost shut down and many had to let go of a lot of employees. Yeah. This brings mm -hmm. one major clause into action force majeure. Yeah. To what extent? the first visual can be enacted in terms of how contracts are, uh, are changing. Uh, and not just because of the fact the startups in Pakistan are doing it with their employees because of the certain issues, but yeah. also mm -hmm. they're facing this same thing vis-a-vis -vis commitments uh, with their international buyers or customers outside Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, so how does that come into play? Can you please share some light? Because this was a question that I was asked by many friends and I thought, okay, I'll put it through today to you. <laughs> Good. So uh, let me preface everything by, by, by saying that uh, I think a lot of people um, are throwing the term force majeure around uh, quite casually, but it has a very specific meaning. And uh, you, I, uh, a lot of audience, I, I think, would be surprised to know that force majeure is not actually recognized by Pakistani law. Uh, force majeure is actually a French term. It comes from civil law. Uh, what we have in, in common law, the, the, the legal regime that we follow, is called frustration. Now, frustration essentially means that if, if the subject matter of a contract ceases to exist, then uh, it, will, it will be unreasonable to ask a party to continue to perform it. So I'll give you an example that if you were supposed to, let's say, trade with um, or, or send a particular shipment to uh, another country and uh, a war is declared between the two countries and it becomes illegal for, your, for, for you as a company to ship those products to that second country, then essentially what has happened is a frustration event has happened. And now it is practically impossible for you to perform your part of the uh, contractual obligations, even if you wanted to. Now, uh, force majeure is slightly different. Force majeure only comes into play, number one, it only comes into play when you have it incorporated within your contract. Number one. Number two, it has to represent the exact event that you are talking about. Now, for example, if your force majeure event says that in case of earthquake or fire or building being damaged, me as the tenant will not be required to pay you, the landlord, then you can use the force majeure clause. But if you have a standard force majeure clause, which does not mention any of those events and those events do not happen, then you will not be able to claim it. So as I said, number one, it has to be included in your contract. So it is essentially what you and I agree to write, number one. Number two, what exactly is the language that has been used? So if your language does not incorporate the exact force majeure event that you are claiming, then um, you will not be able to take benefit from it. For example, let's say, that I am a supplier and you are my customer. And I am, I'm supposed to supply, let's say, 100 cartons of, of product, of a product X to you. And I deliver those 100 cartons of product X to you. And you say that, sorry, my business has been shut down because of COVID-19, and now I will not be able to pay you. Now that force majeure clause, even if we have that in the contract, cannot come to your benefit because I have performed all of my part of the bargain and you are essentially saying that you do not have the money to pay me. Now, the fact that you do not have the money is not a defense that is available under force majeure. You can't use that. Now, 
put let me reverse this example the same example if i am supposed to give you the 100 cartons but the government asks me to shut down my factory right Be because of the covid 19 and i have shut down my factory and i was supposed to deliver those cartons let's say on the 10th of uh, may today but uh, because of the closure i'm not able to operate my factory and I, in our both in our agreement that we have drafted spec specifically it is written that a party will be excused from performance if it is prevented by a government order from performing its obligations now if we have that language within the contract then i can take benefit from that and i can say that sorry i've been delayed in performance and this is the reason this is a justification and now you can't claim that i've breached the contract thank you this gives a lot of clarity but uh even though if uh, for instance force majeure was mentioned in the contract and people are saying that because of uh, the demand that has gone down because of the government uh, enforcing a lockdown we cannot fulfill the orders hence i do not need a further supply from you and you cannot hold me liable Yeah. Uh, does not what you say does not uh, apply for future. No, if if you have no no, that's a very good example you've given me. So if uh, you and I have this contract that says that there is a force majeure clause, right? And mm -hmm. it uh, um, and we both agree that um, uh, that you as the customer and me as the supplier, uh, you as the customer say that I don't want any further orders because of uh, this reduced demand. and i would like to terminate the contract because of force majeure then i think you will be able to do that what i all i'm saying is that you need to see if your contract the language of the force majeure clause allows you to do that if it does then it should be fine okay so we we getting lots of questions as well and i would proceed to q and a just in a bit guys so hang on hang in there Uh, I have a few more questions to ask of my own before I go there. So there were other than these uh, major things that we discussed regarding the startup being recognized, right? Equity. There were certain other changes to the law, I believe, as well. Uh, yeah. But before we go there uh, to some standard changes, which I know regarding company C and uh, certain other board uh, regulations, etc. Uh, during the road shows, we also discussed the crowd equity funding. has that been addressed in this law or is it something still in the works no it has not it has not uh, so uh, and it is frankly uh, i don't think required to be addressed in this company's law so there is nothing as such in the company's law that prevents a party from undertaking equity crowdfunding what is required is is incorporating particular regulations to allow uh, equity crowdfunding to take place Uh, there is perhaps some change required in the securities act which is a different law but um, the companies act itself is is quite open to interpretation and we can certainly say that uh, the law does not prevent uh, equity crowdfunding however uh, the regulator in this case the accp feels that it is it should there should be some regulations around equity crowdfunding and it it they are likely to be introduced after the um, uh, sandbox so once a few um, equity crowdfunding platforms are operating under the sandbox regime and they understand exactly how they are operating what their business models are then we will be in a position to to have regulations for the equity crowdfunding so as you know that we we did draft um, initially a, a, a basic outline of of what those regulations would be but within the accp and the regulator i felt that they 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 felt that they needed more time and perhaps they they could uh, send send the uh, the startups the equity crowdfunding platforms to the sandbox regulations first allow them to operate there for a few months and then introduce um, equity crowdfunding regulations formally All right thank you wow what what other standard changes have been made in this act regarding removal of company seal etc and uh, does these changes also apply in terms of any relaxation of filing of documents certainly yes so i'll just uh, talk about two three which i feel that will probably be relevant to the startups i do want to uh, 
mentioned that these are not all the changes that have been made and this again goes back towards uh, people suggestion that this is a startup law the changes to the companies act actually introduced a, introduce a lot of changes and what we are discussing are only the ones that that uh, i feel are relevant to startups so the first and perhaps um, the most obvious i i i believe the the change is to remove the requirement of company seal a lot of companies have actually gone uh, have stopped uh, even uh, making company seals it used to be a big i don't know if you if you've seen it it's it, it was it used to be a big stamp uh, about a foot long and you would press it on a piece of paper and that seal would 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 be embossed on the on the on the paper and then you would submit that original document to the bank for the company incorporation oh, sorry the bank account opening so a lot of those things were required uh, so so that one requirement thankfully has been removed it it's no longer required and companies actually the the the, the whole section pertaining to company seal has been done away with because it's just so archaic and it's no longer utilized as such um what happened in in 2017 when the new law was introduced uh, they required uh, that as soon as you incorporate a company within 30 days you are required to deposit the share deposit money into the account of the company and this used to be a problem for startups and and founders typically who do not have the funds and and when you are registering a company uh, you generally don't think of it as as um a corporate structure where the shareholders are putting in money and then they there are certain expenditures a lot of the times startups don't have expenditure as such they are just working by themselves and working um, in developing a product so what the scp has done is removed the original requirement that was in the law uh, that said that within 30 days you are required to deposit uh, money in the company as soon as it is registered within th- sorry within 30 days ha- that requirement has been removed but what has uh, i mean i don't think it is going to mean that you will not be required to put any money in the in the company essentially the the regulator the accp will now be able to draft regulations around it and i feel that they will be in a position to extend certain benefits to to, to the startups um another expenditure that startups were required to incur as soon as they registered a yeah. company was uh, they were required to engage a chartered accountant that okay. requirement has been removed so it is not immediately required uh, it's something that you can do later on i would never say that you have uh, the financial statements of a of a company the, the the founders typically should not be in the in the habit of making all of the financial statements themselves they should be taking the advice of of some chartered accountant so all with all due respect to the profession of chartered accountants and and the work they do it's it's important um but the only thing that has changed is perhaps the requirement to engage a chartered accountant immediately has been has been removed but obviously you you still need a chartered accountant uh, going forward okay one thing one thing that perhaps is is uh is is going in the opposite direction but has to be mentioned because i think the audience need need to hear this is that you in 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 the past if you had a if you had a company and you you let's say we go back to the example of you and me we really should think about setting up a startup fuzzy uh <laughs> um if if you and i are the only shareholders in the company and both you and i are the directors and mm. let's say you are the ceo of the company now if there is no change in the subsequent year the, there was no requirement to file the statutory returns every year now that okay. relaxation has been removed now uh, when we do register our startup we will be required to file the annual statutory returns irrespective of whether there is any change or not it is not too cumbersome i mean a lot of people have, have suggested that this is somehow a negative thing i i do feel that it's it's one of those things if you if you are a company and if you're doing something you're you're filing your tax returns so filing your statutory returns shouldn't be too much of a hassle plus in the ease of doing business domain sccp has made it a lot simpler to file statutory returns you can do it online it's not very complicated 
it's it's not as user friendly as as perhaps it could be which, and, under which area one has to go sorry to cut you online to file these returns or on the SCCP is website there check, okay is there a checklist on on SCCP's website that startups can go and access that so what are you have mostly when startups actually uh, join more incubators and accelerators they are bound to get themselves registered as a legal entity but before they are they are part of any such formal organization or activity they keep working in a very informal structure to yeah. bypass or stay away from the regulations for many reasons whatsoever but when they have to raise investment uh, yeah. when they have to interact with people when they have to receive payments yeah. they need to get pretty formalized and they need to yeah. register so they shy away from it because often we have thought of it as something which is cumbersome because you have to interact with the government it's very long you have to hire middlemen or seek help from lawyers or accountants as you just yeah. mentioned in this case so while we we jumped a lot of spaces on the ease of doing business recently and i am sure the the recent uh, reforms will help us further go up uh, what do you say for those startups uh and, and there is a question here as well which relates to a little bit to that as well uh well i don't want to go to the question completely but which pretty much says that if we remain in an informal way we are not structured formally we do yeah. not have to comply to a lot of regulations but when we do we do not have a way to keep track of them ki mujhe ab kaun si return jama karani thi and as you mentioned so who to go to and where is this checklist or a bible that one can access and which is not a very very legal way but also something that a common man can do so for see uh, this is a this is a startup idea right there uh, somebody making a checklist for uh, any startup who wants to remain compliant who wants to know exactly when to file tax returns statutory returns but on a more serious note uh, the scgp has a guideline uh, i think it's fairly readable it's available on their on their website they have a startup specific portal as well people can go there but i do want to take a step back and i do want to address um, the elephant in the room and i feel that a lot of startups actually uh, do not take or make the effort of understanding what the what their regulatory obligations are and uh, it's it's sort of like a ostrich solution where you stick your head in a in a sand in the hope that nobody is going to come come to you and and make make uh, or create problems for you i feel the solution to any uh, uh, challenge of this sort is to face it head on understand take the effort of understanding exactly what your regulatory requirements are fbr is not easy but at the same time you as a as a as a startup you need to understand what your tax obligations are no its investor is going to talk to you if you do not if you're not tax compliant aap tax chori karte hain to aap apna apna business to kar lenge apne bistar ke niche paise to chupa lenge but investor aapke sath kaam nahi karega and the same goes with uh, with other regulatory compliance you you need to have a compliance culture in order for you to be taken seriously by anyone that's two three at the same time all that i've said i do not encourage founders to go out and register companies on day one there are some fundamental issues associated with that so what a lot of founders i feel uh, end up doing is that you, again uh, and and you know you know you you and i fell in the same uh, um, uh, bucket as well that we gave each other 50% shareholding without talking about exactly what the role and responsibility of the parties are how are or why we are giving each other that equity so understanding what the shareholder or co-founder is bringing to the table what is the importance of that and and what that should, uh, that equity structure would be let's say one year down the road and so i feel that you, uh, the incorporation should be it should be an event that should happen sometime when you are much more crystallized in terms of what your business idea is you have a solution that is sort of nearing completion and now you are going to start talking to third parties that is probably around the time when you start looking at registration of the company if you incorporate a company on day 1 just because you and i and friends are and we say oh let's let's go 
uh, since it's it only takes a couple uh, four hours to register a company on on the SCCP website now. Let's just register a company, but we don't take it anywhere after that because you know our equity positions do not reflect the reality, or we are not no longer interested in continuing with the with the startup. So it's sort of it, it, there isn't a perfect time I can say, but there is definitely not the beginning. This is a very valuable advice. Thank you, but. Uh, company uh, registration is not the only form of a business to be legally recognized either, right? This is also yeah. a very big pitfall that most of uh, people who do not have any advisors to guide them, unfortunately, go up registering a private limited company upfront, which they do not realize has a lot of obligations and, uh, as you just mentioned, to adhere to. So, and if you're not meticulously compliant about them, you will fall in a lot of issues regarding whether it is the FBR chasing you for not filing returns on time or yeah. whether it is your bank or uh, your investors or partners chasing you that you know, you're not showing up as a compliant uh, corporate entity. So yeah. sole proprietorship, single member company uh, or an association of persons or often called partnership otherwise, there are many legal forms and I believe our startups uh, or founders who, are, who joined us should actually go there is a lot of material online available on SCCP's website and otherwise as well. And those of you have also asked, of course, at the end, we'll request uh, Beres Josiah to share his contact details or however you can reach him. Uh, so, so do reach out to people who can give you their advice uh, from a legal standpoint, but just much of it is available online. Don't go upfront unless you need to be a private limited company, which is often the reason of raising capitals or, yeah. or, or, or issues of shares or otherwise. So let's jump on to questions, Jose. Uh, lots yeah. and lots of questions pouring in from Facebook and online here as well. So uh, I would request if you can give quick brief answers and because I would love that we answer all of them if I can in this short sure. time. So this one is from Samir Bukhari. He says, can you please shed some light on LNP registrations with SECP, the steps required and the reporting requirements? Also, can it be done all online? Yes, it can be done online. If you go to the SCCP website, I believe that they have a step-by-step -step guide for registration of an LLP. Can you please tell I do, whether it is sccp.gov.pk or startup.sccp, the portal they have? Uh, no, no, sccp.gov.pk. Okay. And uh, um, I do want to point out very quickly that LLP is only advisable if you are in the services business or if you are in the nature where you are unlikely to attract a lot of uh, equity injection because uh, startups, if, if, you, if you, let's say, are, are providing consultancy business, then LLP is a perfect solution for you. And private company perhaps is not that uh, perfect. But um, so if you go down that road, then perhaps you need to understand or, and, and appreciate why you're doing it. Number one. Number two, tax uh, liability and reporting requirements are exactly the same as a private limited company. So it is treated under law as a private limited company by the tax authorities. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've also typed uh, the answer, but I believe it's not difficult for me to type the answers for you. So I hope you guys are listening. Recording would be available. I won't be able to type the answers next. So I'll just uh, ask the questions. The next is from Bajahat Khan. Uh, it's a little bit longer one. He says, uh, seventh schedule of the Companies Act 2017 specifically lays down the table of fees to be paid to the registrar and the commission by the companies under section 462 and 469, both in the submission of documents electronically or in the physical form with different fee structure. As electronically filled documents require electronic signatures or advanced electronic signatures, therefore they shall be subject to the authentication under electronic transactions ordinance. Uh, I don't know the question, but I believe he's just trying to ask you if that is so. So no, uh, it is it is probably not the case. Uh, number one, um, you can file documents um, online by uh, printing it, signing it, and submitting it online. So this is what has been happening. You can now uh, utilize electronic transaction ordinance, and I'm. I, for Jahad, for all intents and purposes, I'm extremely happy that there is finally an interest around this. C can you believe this law was introduced in 2002 
and for 18 years we have not utilized the full benefits of this law this is such a important document sorry important piece of law that allows uh, transactions it, it, it essentially recognizes electronic transactions you and i can enter into a contract in email form without having to print it on a on a stamp paper and get it signed all of that is covered under this law but unfortunately the 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 uh, the remaining government agencies were not utilizing the full benefits of this now for example um, a few years back i think it's about 5 6 years now maybe less uh, even the government of punjab has introduced the e stamp uh, website where you can uh, obtain this the the stamp online what uh, perhaps is the is the logical future of this is that you just pay the fee online and you get some sort of a digital sticker that you can put on the on, on the document but or 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 a, or a unique reference number that you put on your document and and that should be it so perhaps we can we can ultimately get away with with even going to the bank and obtaining the the computerized stamp paper but i i am quite happy that we are finally looking at electronic transaction id Excellent. I believe Ajahat had had another question on the same line, so I believe that's answered. This is from Shabazz Ali Khan. Can a company or a startup use a convertible note for raising investment in Pakistan as per the Pakistani law? Was convertible note part of the discussion in the terms of the new amendment? Well, I do know that Shabazz before there is still there answers. It was part of a discussion. We were there, but let him answer of it being a part of the law. so uh, the short answer to that is yes uh, convertible note uh, is permitted in fact um, the the securities act specifically calls convertible note a, a type of security so to to the short answer to that is yes you can certainly raise investments by issuing a convertible note perhaps what is still not uh, perfectly available is that you can incorporate that convertible note in terms of your statutory filings that you do before the sccp so that is something that is perhaps uh, a gap but the short answer is yes you can raise investments it is recognized under law a lot of uh, investments that that are happening right now are in the form of convertible notes and um, both local and foreign so a lot of international investors yes, um, uh, who are who are undertaking angel investments where especially you do it's not a priced round and you do not exactly know what the the value of the startup would be convertible note becomes a, a much more easier uh, document to execute so it's it's something that's happening and um, it's recognized absolutely and it's a contract you see the company is is giving a promise that sometime in the future it is going to convert this amount of money into yeah. into equity so it's a it's a contract yeah. and there is nothing in the law to prevent that thank you uh, the next one is from farooq kandhari he says under the new definition can a startup company be a non tech company such as a sports management company or an event management company for the sake of understanding it's a good question although it may be a very simple question for many but uh, yeah so is is a is the definition of a startup limited to technology no it is not uh, in the in the grand scheme of things but there are certain uh, uh, it not all companies are startups let me put it this way and there are certain things that you need to be doing in terms of uh, what you what you uh, do so as i uh, said in the beginning um, the the definition uh, let me just open it up so that i can give specific reference to it Guys, keep your questions, uh, please, short. Uh, yeah, so, those so questions uh, that have been asked, don't re-ask them. Thank you. Yeah. So, Fasi, it's it's basically if you are uh, working towards innovation, development, or improvement of products, so the uh, goods are definitely included, or processes or services, or is a scalable business model with a high potential of employment generation or wealth generation, or for such other pur purposes. as may be specified so in the grand scheme of things i would say a lot is is covered in this a, a simple brick and mortar shop is unlikely to be covered but if you are innovative and you are 
disrupting your industry then of course you 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 you'd be quite likely to be classified as a startup brilliant thank you we'll also take some questions uh, uh, from facebook that we have received hasan zameer you have raised your hand if you have a query please send it in the question and answer section uh, or uh, you know all in the chat section thank you ji so uh, this is from manzoor aziz he says uh, can you please share step by step pr process for documentation preparation for a startup com startup company registration mostly aspirants and students have a difficulty in understanding and preparing the required documents uh, if it is possible then please do arrange a separate session on this with complete tax and all other requirements under fatf reporting guidelines as well, well so, so you see you see this is this is a startup idea fazi i'm telling you lekin baat ye bhi hai ki i i would say this i had uh, you know for a long time i must confess i used to hire help from professionals to file my tax returns yeah okay yeah. and 6 years or 5 years ago it dawned upon me that i have been working in enabling people on technology for such a long time what could be so difficult and i was working in in government right e governance and all yeah and i i went through the income tax ordinance on my own section by section what does this mean although it is absolutely not user friendly but i started filing my own return although it's it still scares me when i know that the time is near and i have to file because it's a huge ordeal to go through but the same happened when i was about to register my company yeah. uh, my own startup and uh, and i thought it would take time but then we're also working with startups here as well uh, this has gone significantly down it is yeah. all online it yeah. is uh, all the details are there so manzoor if you're listening uh, i would request uh, was there to add more if he wants to but this is all so, online it takes yeah. less than a day to process uh, in terms of document or, or some basic steps perhaps if you could share some time no I, i i don't think that i can add anything else to it i think it's just an attitude so you have to take out the effort you're already on the internet go and google you know, the the documents that are required if you if you search the accp's website in particular you'll find the the the, the they have uh, the guide that is there and the process is not difficult at all you can do it online if you do face any issues um you know you can you can ask around but generally it's a very straightforward process i, I it's not perfect of, of course but um, you know it's, it's it, you you don't need hands down you don't need a lawyer to help you register the company in pakistan all right the next question is from uruj kamar again from facebook uh it is a little bit to what extent uh, to some extent you've already answered to this but let's have a short one so uh with respect to informal entrepreneurs how does regulatory framework aim to cater them uh new startups actually prefer remaining informal due to avoid regulations and is it wise to go for any legalities at early stage i believe she's trying to say to be a formal registered entity at early stage yeah so as i said it, it's not there there isn't a perfect time the beginning is definitely not perfect but it is probably a stage where you are quite clear where you are in terms of your business and you feel that that you want to now talk start talking to third parties in terms of providing your products and services you want to potentially start attracting investments um so once you are nearing that stage then perhaps you can then undertake the formal incorporation and and structure uh, firstly i do want to give a give one particular comment that i've often heard from from investors and that is that they do not like to talk to any um startup that is not well versed in the regulatory regime that they are operating in now what what does that mean that means that if you are let's say manufacturing a particular product you need to understand the exact licenses that are required yeah. to manufacture that product and yeah. if you are not aware of those licensing requirements they are going to think of you as somebody who is not very serious now i am not saying that you um, will there will be absolute shutting of the door as far as the investor is concerned if you are if you are slightly non compliant right so a lot of times startups are operating on the fringes and they want to challenge uh, what is the uh, norm and equity crowdfunding is perhaps a very good example 
of that that it is just around the edges and there is no there is a slight gray area that you want to operate in and you as the as the startup understand that this is what you are doing and you whoever investor that you're talking to you 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 explain that you understand that this is a gray area the rest of it i'm perfectly clear but if you say that uh, i don't know how to file my taxes or oh, sorry if you if you say that i haven't filed my taxes in the last few years they are not going to treat you very seriously i absolutely agree and i hope all of those who are listening you know you don't take it lightly you can shy away from it if you're talking for in terms of any formal arrangement partnership investment or anything of that sort you must know the space you are operating in the last thing you should know you should would like to do is that you slap with a notice on your uh, you know on your desk or on in your email that you are you know non compliant etc so that's not we would like to go for uh, quickly ji farhan uh, azim sadiqi says can you please comment regarding different types of businesses that are just can be registered with sec is it only for registering a private company or for partnership or what other sorts so there are there are two uh, one is uh, a, a limited liability partnership that was recently introduced and the second is the company private limited company if you are a sole proprietor business it is not registered with the secp it is just registered with the with the fbr and you tell the fbr that i have i've set up this sole proprietor business the next question is from hasan zami if we already registered a startup as a private limited company before this amendment came into play so are we also considered as a startup or do what advantages disadvantages we can have from this act do we need to uh, go and update our records that's a very good question so number 1 yes. it it basically uh, you benefit from it if you were incorporated any time uh, in the last 10 years so if you were incorporated let's say in 2018 you're you're covered if you were incorporated in 2011 you're still a startup but if you are incorporated in 2009 then you are not a startup because it you have been in you have been in business for more than 10 years number one number two as far as the benefits i would say that a lot of the benefits have not been fully unlocked the law merely recognizes startups as some some uh, a special entity that has to be given certain privileges and protections and those privileges and protections are going to come uh towards the startups in the near future so for example there may be relaxation in filing requirements there may be relaxation in terms of the 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 capital contribution that we have talked about so so a lot of relaxations and facilitations are going to be made available to startups in the future which are perhaps not available right now all right another question is uh by wajahat that nift which was uh, is accredited under basically the electronic certification accreditation council uh, was providing digital signature services for secp e services up till 2017 for 9 years 70000 businesses were using it and then all of a sudden those services have been halted by secp for the past few years uh, while we all are working in a very digital age right now to so importance of digital ad- identity is so uh, so clear to everyone um your views on that uh, so deft is is one entity that is uh, providing uh, accredited signature services it is by no, no means the only one now uh, if you uh, i i believe that there is at least one other startup that is actually providing digital signature services in pakistan and there is definitely an opportunity for others as well so ccp had the option of utilizing nift for whatever reason i and i think i we should let accp answer that yeah. why they why they removed uh, or stopped using nift but um, they they no they no longer use it so that so nift was just one of the agencies that there must yeah, be yeah, so it's not in so let's move on it. yeah brilliant uh this is uh, by a case example by mohammad ali jamal so he says that for employee stock option if a startup hires a person and gives them a stock option let's say 2% of this stay in the startup for 2 years but the startup during this time also receives an investment and share positions gets diluted will that also dilute or would the same person who was given 2% according to the law be uh, would it be subject to dilution or not basically 
of course the answer is yes the uh, essentially if if you uh, we'll go back to the example that we were discussing right so yeah. uh, you and i have 100 shares and we uh, decide to give uh, 10 shares to uh, another shareholder now what is the total number of share uh, shares 110 if we issue 90 more shares you are being diluted um i myself i am being diluted and and the, the 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 employee stock option the person that we gave that person shares the 10 shares he is going to be diluted as a matter of percentage the answer is yes of course uh, everybody will be diluted okay so the next one is isn't equity crowdfunding prohibited under the ambit of section 84 of companies act which prohibits acceptance of deposits from the public It's, uh, that's a very good question so this this has been uh, this is being discussed or this was discussed quite extensively when we were yes. working towards drafting the uh, equity crowdfunding regulations now uh, what is relevant is the definition of uh, deposit and the mode of attracting that deposit and it was felt that that if you publish it in the newspaper for example or you put it out in the television that that you are attracting these deposits then it would be illegal and the argument that that we built was that it would not be illegal if we create a moat around it and essentially it's gate gate keep uh, there is a gatekeeper there and you have a website where you log in you are an accredited investor there is a criteria for that and you need that if you have access to that information then it is not public so you're not going to the public okay uh what are the conditions so this is a question by shamaila she's asking what are the conditions for registering non profit organization uh, by the way i do know this is not happening these days we have been trying to get one as well it's not that easy to do it but let 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 the professional person answer and is it better to register as a consultancy firm as compared to non profit So yeah, yeah, I, the, 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 yeah. I know. I, I know exactly what uh, Shumaila is talking about. So you are spot on. The incorporating a non-profit is not easy. Uh, this yeah. happened, up, I think, about four or five years ago when there was a lot of issues around the misuse of uh, of the investment. Oh, sorry, the donations that were being given to the non-profit organizations. It's not impossible, right? So there, there is a process, and that process can range anywhere between four to six months. and currently um, your application goes to uh, the special branch of the police the, uh, we we in last year we incorporated a a non profit for a, a a large organization and it it took 3 months b- but the special branch then sends it to four security agencies uh, i believe it's the fia the the cia not, not the american one pakistani um the uh, uh, and uh, i think it's uh, intelligence bureau and 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 one other so all of the four and and uh, mi and all of the four security agencies approve the members who are part of the um non profit organization and then once it is done you you are registered so definitely if you are in a consultancy business uh then perhaps it is more easier for you to just register yourself as a as a consultancy company uh this is a question by bilal he says it's a layman question perhaps but if you're starting a sole proprietorship for and uh, we register it with pec which i believe is the equivalent to cp in the punjab province no 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 so this is pakistan engineering council pakistan engineering council okay sorry Register it with PEC, which already requires an NTN number from the RTO. Do we still need to get registered with SECP? If yes, why? No. For sole proprietorship, we said it's not. Yeah, yeah, you're not required. Yeah, you, you're not. You can, yeah. He already explained for the company. So, yeah, Omar Farooq says, can we presently raise equity crowdfunding abroad, let's say from UK, and bring that money in Pakistan or invest internationally on product development and marketing, but the company is registered in Pakistan? Oh, Umar has opened such a huge can of worms. I don't, I don't, I don't think we can answer it today. Uh, but, but you need to. I'll give you the the brief reference to the laws that you can perhaps look at yourself. You need to look at Chapter 19 of the Foreign Exchange Manual. You need to look at Chapter 20 of the Foreign Exchange Manual. You need to look at Section 13 of the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act 1947. And then we can have that this conversation. The short answer is is it's not easy, but perhaps you can do it. Brilliant. 
Thank you so much, uh, Ozair. This is the last question uh, from Sundas. She says, can we put our own policies and customize it to describe the policies after registering a company? I believe policies are not required. It's memorandum and articles. Yes, I, I think what Sundas is perhaps meant, uh, referring to is indeed the articles. And yes, you can... Yes. Uh, amend the articles based on your uh, your own interests and 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 desires, and you can structure. Uh, so perhaps we can spend a, a half a second, half a minute on this. So essentially, there are two constituting documents when you register a company. One is the memorandum, and the second is the articles. The memorandum tell the public what this company does. For example, it says that this is a company that is in the business of manufacturing certain goods. So that is the public facing document. The articles are essentially the constitution of the company and how it operates. For example, how the shareholder meeting is going to be called, how the director meetings is going to be called. Unless you violate the company's law and you go anywhere outside of the purview of what is permitted under company law, you can change the articles and you can do what you want. Thank you. Yeah, so there's lots of questions pouring in. Guys, that's enough. <laughs> I wish I could answer. Uh, but this is the last. Uh, as Mr. Zaire is saying, many changes will be unlocked in future while law has been, since the law has been enforced. Uh, so basically what Ibrar has asked is that uh, if the law has been enforced and it's been introduced, why we cannot enjoy the features or the changes that have been reflected there against, uh, why would it be unlocked in the future? So if you um, look at the uh, documents, uh, look at the changes that have been made, they essentially say that the ACCP is going to make regulations for that. Um, <clears throat> so as essentially what the ACCP uh, is going to do is going to, it is going to pass uh, regulations and those regulations are going to uh, determine how or what is the process? What are the documentation that you that you will be required? So the law essentially unlocks the and, and makes it possible for the SCCP to ultimately uh, make it possible for startups to do what they want to do. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much. This uh, brings this uh, discussion to a close. Uh, we, we, we've actually taken more time from you, Zair, and also uh, audience who has been very consistently available live interacting with us. Thank you so much, guys. Those who are online on Zoom, those who joined us uh, from uh, Facebook, uh, I really appreciate. Uh, someone raised their hand, Basim, if you have any question, please share it. Uh, okay, take a second. Yeah. Yes, uh, Bilal, AOP is different from a sole proprietor. AOP is basically essentially a partnership. Okay, so uh, many people are raising hands, uh, Asad then Shamila and others. Uh, I wish I could allow everyone to talk, but if you have questions, you have already placed them, we've answered. Shamila, your question has already been answered by Zach. Uh, so I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna lay it out there. My I've, I've put my email address in the in the chat. And if yes. there are if there are follow up questions, I'll be more than happy to to answer them. And and I was about to say the same. How can they contact you? So I believe you are reachable on LinkedIn as well. Uh, I'm reachable on LinkedIn. Yes. Yes. So guys, you can uh, look him up, connect with him on uh, Ahmed Uzair. Is he goes by that name on LinkedIn? Shamila, Vasim, and Asad, I see your hands up. We are unfortunately close uh, with 23 minutes beyond the time that we scheduled. If Zaid allows, I could have asked you, but even if he allows, he has also other commitments and his family to give time to. He's shared his email address. It's U-Z-A-I-R, which is Zaid, at the rate of A-U-C-L-A-W, A-U-C-Law.com. So yeah, uh, you could reach out to him with your queries. Thank you so much. This session was brought to you in partnership with uh, our partners, ACCA Global. We also have Ali Shan Haq here from ACCA. So thank you, Ali. Thank you, ACCA. I hope uh, the members uh, from ACCA community also enjoyed this conversation. It was very informative for me and very insightful. Uh, thank you, Zaire. I believe uh, we need to do more on uh, probably a legal clinic, perhaps, for our startups, because uh, yeah. there is a lot of interest now on uh, IP, on filing patents, on copyright infringements, and on trademarks, yeah. which is very, very important. Uh, let's yeah. have a chat sometime later on that. So thank you so Looking much. Forward to it. Take care. Have a good night. My thank pleasure. You, ladies and gentlemen. My
my pleasure my pleasure thank you fazi thank you take care everybody bye 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 thank you it's a wrap guys